Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be with you. And it's been a while since we did a Zoom uh, update to the press, but it's a real privilege to get another chance to do it and let Californians uh, just sort of know where we are with uh, COVID, Omicron in specific, and what we've been seeing and how it's informed the decisions we've made. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a familiar set of slides that you've seen before, at least the background, uh, uh, and and then uh, happy to take questions at the end uh, and, and look forward to that. So uh, if I could advance to the next slide, please. So the objectives today are three, three simple ones. One, outline our current data trends. Uh, that should tee up and set up a explanation of where we are and where we're going with state masking requirements. And then lastly, uh, talk about schools and, and specifically uh, the approach to keeping schools open and thriving. Next slide. So uh, we've seen this, we've talked about it for a long time, ever since those first days, nearly two years ago, when we started informing Californians and over two years ago, since we started working on uh, trying to understand what SARS-CoV-2 or COVID uh, is doing here in California. And we've used the science to guide our health protection strategies throughout the entirety of the pandemic. And the data do show that these strategies have done what we said we wanted to do, which was save lives. Next slide. Uh, these numbers that I'm sharing, I, I uh, don't want to take them lightly. Uh, there is tragedy here. There are over 80,000 Californians who've lost their life to COVID. Um, I know that our family, my family, uh, has had that sadness and that impact. Uh, in my extended family too. And I share that moment. Uh, uh, I've taken many moments with my team and colleagues to recognize the lives that have been lost. And despite those efforts that have really put California collectively in a place that uh, in some ways we should be proud of the efforts. We went in to save lives and we've done that. When you look at California, among other populated states that have uh, somewhat similar conditions that we do. Uh, UC California has done well with our overall uh, cumulative death rate comparatively. That said, the sadness is real. Uh, we announce uh, new numbers every day that add to that total. And uh, I have always wanted to be part of a team that continues to put efforts forward to save lives and protect Californians. Next slide. So I wanna go through some slides uh, similar to what we've done before on the data. Next one, please. So if you look at where we are today uh, compared to a month ago, and we've done these comparisons throughout the pandemic, and I think they're important. Um, they aren't necessarily the peaks that were on January 14th, but it's fair to compare where we've been in a month. Uh, cases have dropped 70, over 75% uh, compared to a month ago. Hospitalizations have also dropped, and I'll tell you, both of those numbers were not peaks, the 93,000, the 13,776. Those are not peaks. We saw higher numbers at different times, so the difference today versus the peak is even greater. Uh, but case numbers have come down quite a bit. Those hospitalizations now almost at 8,000, um, nearly where we would predicted they'd be around this time, down 40, over 40%. Hospital admissions, an increasingly important number. What do I mean by that? It's the number of people on a day that are showing up at the emergency room with COVID and get admitted. This number has dropped a tremendous amount just in the last month. And this wasn't even the peak at 2,800. We saw over 3,500 individuals admitted on some of the days in January. Uh, and then test positivity, something we've tracked from the beginning, something that California has really put a lot of investment in, being able to see how COVID is spreading, see how Omicron is moving in our communities through testing. And that test positivity climbed well above 20 a month ago, 22.9. Today reported out at 6.2%. So nearly a 73% reduction in test positivity. Next slide. So what are these data showing us? That just as cases rapidly increase, they are rapidly declining. 
hospitalizations, both pediatric and adult, are trending downward. And deaths, which always lag hospitalization in cases, are climbing now, but we anticipate that in the coming weeks, the deaths should decline as well. Next slide. If you look at uh, what the scientists or the epidemiologists call the epidemiologic curve, the epi curve for California, um, you see that throughout the pandemic, we've seen some pretty steep high rises that uh, cases a year ago, just over a year ago in the 2021, with 2020, 2021 winter surge, that they climbed nearly to 60,000 reported cases on a given day. And then if you look on the far right and what we've been dealing with over the past eight weeks, uh, you see this tremendous, steep, incredibly high curve that goes straight up and then begins to come straight down. Not unlike what other states and other nations that have experienced Omicron ahead of us have seen, uh, we see this tremendous increase in cases. Uh, the orange line represents hospitalizations, and it's important to identify a few things about that line. First, uh, it's really not that much lower than the real difficulty we saw last year. We climbed above 15,000 individuals hospitalized for and with COVID uh, during the last many weeks, uh, but it's still lower than we were last year. Uh, and it needs to be contextualized in the backdrop of a hospital delivery system that was above its normal census at this time. So those added 15,000 cases of COVID were um, really challenging for hospitals. And uh, there was a great deal of work to make sure that those hospitals uh, had the support that they needed to take care of not just patients with COVID, but many, many other patients as well. And then the second point when you look at hospitalizations and cases is that uh, this time around with Omicron, we saw what some people call the decoupling between cases and hospitalizations, that even though there were many, many cases, fewer cases were hospitalized versus earlier surges like the Delta surge, where you see the, 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 the bump right before this far right uh, peak, where you see the hospital number much closer to the reported number of cases. So that decouple is really important. It recognizes that Omicron has not been as virulent as other strains of COVID, that it hasn't led to as many hospitalizations, as many ICU admissions, as in many deaths as prior strains of the virus. That is encouraging news, of course, on the one hand, but it isn't. Always, it hasn't always been the pattern with COVID, and we shouldn't expect it to be moving forward necessarily. Next slide, please. Uh, we've talked to you for a long time about models. We've been using models in California. We have uh, various models that stand on their own, and then we have an ensemble or a composite model that we update regularly and post and share publicly so people can see where California is sort of predicting we might go. This model, one, you don't need to remember the name, but the Lemma model, one of the reasons why I like it and chose to share it with you today is because it's a model that uses uh, uh, hospital admissions and numbers to really understand the complexity of what's happening in our community with everything from transmissions to the level of hospitalizations that we can anticipate. It's been a good and accurate model uh, and has helped us quite a bit. And you can see here that we climbed uh, the, the green boxes are the actual numbers. And then the blue line is where we believe uh, the hospitalizations are heading. And if you look at today, uh, we're, we're not far off from where the model is. And the projections moving forward are the continued decline in hospital numbers. We often always see that the rate of decline slows after it initially is high. And that's not unexpected, but the idea that we'll continue to see reductions in numbers is very important for the decisions that we're making now. Um, we've always talked about how we need to keep the hospital system well supported and protected so they can take care of all the needs of Californians. And this gives us a little bit more confidence that that's where we're heading. Next slide. So one key point to make is that this approach that we've had uh, has always adapted to the changing conditions of COVID. 
and that we continue to learn to deploy the mitigation strategies. What do I mean by mitigation strategies? Things like masking, things like uh, using isolation, things like testing. And we learn to use these mitigation strategies in more precise and smarter ways every day and every month that we move forward through the pandemic. Next slide. And part of this has really led to what we like to talk about as multiple layers of protection against COVID. And you can see here and at different moments throughout the last two years, we've emphasized different parts of this uh, set of layers. Uh, first, as a real baseline foundation, we've told people if you can spend time outdoors, do it. We know the outdoor fresh circulating air helps reduce transmission. And then, of course, stay home when you're sick. We talk about common sense measures, and that's one of them. And I think Californians do that uh, much more now than they did before the pandemic. We also talked about how large gatherings uh, are, are, uh, are, are places where spread is more likely and avoiding them when possible is important. We've emphasized this at different times when transmission rates were different more than we did at other times, but it's still an important tool. We've learned more and have begun to emphasize more the importance of improving indoor ventilation, that air quality, circulating air. We talked a lot around the holidays, keep your window open, keep a door open. Uh, improvements in filtration uh, efforts can really make a difference. Uh, and this has been and continues to be a core strategy here in California. Wash your hands, focus on wearing a mask. Uh, we've learned a lot about the value of masking, how it is an important tool, and that it's a tool that works uh, when we need it. And, and uh, it's really helped, and I'll show uh, another slide in a moment, uh, about some of the data that's specific to California that's demonstrated at times in the pandemic the value of masking. And then uh, nothing new to any of you, the get vaccinated and if eligible, get boosted as a real primary tool. And we've seen uh, the, the impact of getting immunized uh, on the most severe outcomes of death and hospitalization, uh, but also an important distinction between the level of infections among those who are vaccinated and boosted versus the unvaccinated. Uh, sure, we've seen people who have gotten vaccinated also get infected. Thankfully, they don't get nearly as sick and same risk of having a bout outcome, but we have seen a difference even in those infection rates between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. So all of these collectively are those layers of protection that have helped California get through the last two years and uh, have uh, uh, important uh, and, and uh, important to families the outcomes that we've uh, experienced throughout. Next slide. So I want to get into masking, and I know there's a lot of discussion on masking. There is a tremendous amount of uh, energy and focus, and it's important. It's something that Californians have leaned on, and, and I would just say, and I should have said it earlier, we have uh, always depended on 40 million Californians coming together in large part to keep moving forward our state, not just our health protection, but so many other areas of our economy, our schools, uh, our businesses, uh, and it has taken tremendous work. And in California, we have uh, really worked hard to make sure that we empower and inform people the valuable tools, uh, those layers, and masks is one of them. And just a couple of weeks ago, California shared uh, a study done by our own California Department of Public Health that looked at the real life experience uh, with using masks in public settings uh, throughout California uh, and, and uh, the impact of those masks. And what the study showed, it was published by the CDC just recently, was that uh, versus no mask, uh, wearing a cloth mask reduced your odds of getting COVID by 56%, surgical mask, 10% better. And those respirators, those N95s, KN95s that are becoming more commonplace, did a tremendous amount to reduce the odds of getting uh, infected uh, uh, if, you, if you do wear a mask. So the idea that uh, as a tool, masks do what we hope they would do. Uh, of course, this depends on how well you wear it, how often you wear it, not just the type of mask, but we know that some masking is better than none. 
and that respirators uh, provide superior protection. And we know that this is a tool. And like every tool, you need to use it prudently. You need to use it uh, at certain times more than other times. And it's important that we in California continue to lift up the evidence, not just that they do what we hope they do, but that they're a tool that should be used at certain times more than others. Next slide. So just to put in context uh, the masking decisions at the state, I just want to remind you where we've been since the beginning of December when I stood on the first day of December uh, in the Central Valley with the governor to announce the first, the identification of the first Omicron case here in the United States, the case in San Francisco. We identified one shortly after that. We started to see signals in wastewater surveillance systems across the state that uh, that potentially there was a community spread of Omicron. And then on December 10th, uh, we announced that we would put in place a temporary, and I'll emphasize temporary public indoor masking requirement. Uh, we moved from what was strongly recommended into the requirement. And what were the trends at that time? We saw cases climbing really fast and the spread was faster than ever. That uh, repro uh, effective reproductive number, the R effective that we've talked about during uh, throughout this pandemic was higher than it had ever been. And we already knew that hospitals were uh, above average in their census. They were taking care of lots and lots of patients, not just with COVID, at that time Delta uh, infections, but also other needs that uh, had been built up over two years of many people not necessarily accessing the care that they needed. Um, and now having to seek hospital level care. And then at that time, the level of uncertainty was really high. We didn't know if the therapeutics worked against Omicron. We didn't know how well the vaccines worked. We didn't know if kids or older Californians were gonna be more heavily impacted. The level of uncertainty across the globe was high. On January 5th, the day we decided to extend the, at the time, the one month uh, temporary public indoor masking requirement. We decided to extend it again now till Feb through February 15th. Uh, we were still at a time when cases were nearly three times the peak from January 2021. We knew we didn't know exactly how high it had gone, but we now know that January 4th, we had over 152,000 reported cases of COVID in the state. We know that spread was still expanding, that we hadn't begun contracting, that for every one person infected, they were likely to infect more than one other Californian, and that hospitals were struggling. They were doing the work that they always do. Staff were coming and continuing to fight the good fight against COVID to keep Californians as healthy as possible, but they were having to deal with so many other factors. Staff were becoming sick uh, and having to be out and uh, they were the level of uncertainty at that time was still high. We were beginning to learn how uh, Omicron behaved in our communities, but we weren't quite uh, with the level of confidence that we even have today. So on February 7th, we announced a move from a requirement to a strong recommendation for indoor public masking. Uh, the conditions on that date were cases that started to come down significantly, I showed you earlier. The data of cases dropping from January 14th till now, and that was true on the 7th. Spread was beginning to contract. We had seen that re, re, uh, the effective reproductive number drop well below one, meaning that uh, when one person was identified as a positive case, they were infecting fewer than one other Californian. And that means that we would start to see contraction of the total caseload and that that would over time continue to drop. And um, very importantly, hospital staffing was improving. The COVID census was coming down and the total census overall in the hospitals, which is a number. The last time I was with all of you, we emphasized that that had started to come down and our level of uncertainty had dropped as well. We felt more confident that we understood how Omicron was going to move through our communities, how it was going to impact. And it's not to say it doesn't have impact. That would be uh, the wrong message to send. It's been great impact. People have lost their life 
to this nasty virus. And that continues. That said, we understand a lot better where it's heading and what's happened over the last many weeks. And that is why, next slide, please. We are prepared after tomorrow to allow the guidance for public indoor settings for vaccinated individuals to move from a requirement to a strong recommendation. And it's important to know that we're moving just from a requirement to a strong recommendation, not to a recommendation and not that masks are optional. We're still strongly recommending that people wear them in public indoor places. And on top of that, for the unvaccinated, there's still a requirement to wear them in public indoor places, in healthcare settings, in schools and childcare settings, in long-term care settings, in jails and prisons, for both vaccinated and unvaccinated, it remains a requirement. And I'll remind you that just the way California has always worked, 61 local health jurisdictions, partners through and through uh, this pandemic, that those local requirements may be additive to the above state requirements in certain places. Next slide, please. So I wanna just take a moment and talk about schools. You know, this has been really important as a pediatrician, a father of four, something that I talk a lot about at home with my own kids, uh, in my community, with many of the leaders throughout the state, uh, not just in health and public health, but beyond about this important uh, conversation. Uh, next slide. So I wanna just highlight that through the leadership of so many, in the education community, uh, in, among our elected leaders, counties, cities, school districts, the state, uh, there has been a winning formula put together that mitigation and the outcomes of this year put, put push towards. We have put in uh, over 31 million Californians who've stepped up to get vaccinated. Uh, when adults get vaccinated, that supports the kids. When kids get vaccinated, that supports the other kids and their siblings. And uh, this has been a tremendous work. We still have work to do. I'm not dismissing that, but it's important to celebrate the success of the vaccination effort here in California. Yes, still equity gaps, still work to do to get more our youngest Californians vaccinated at rates that we want to see go up. And we really hope and expect will go up as more time is seen to confirm the safety and uh, the effectiveness in the vaccines and more families and caregivers and children get their questions about the vaccine answered by trusted messengers in their community, their healthcare providers, we really are leaning in to get this number up. $850 million invested in school safety protocols throughout the last two years that have made a difference whether that's staff who are aware and able to do the important work to keep schools safe or improvements in ventilation, setting up testing programs, um, just a tremendous amount of work. $23.5 million, uh, million high quality masks sent to school staff, uh, 6 million tests, uh, almost 6 million tests administered at schools to date. Those are state-supported school testing sites, many others that are county-supported or school district-supported as well. Um, and then a tremendous amount of work to get over 15 million at-home tests distributed to schools, many of them, the vast majority, just since the middle of December when Omicron began to rear its head. So this set of mitigating factors, these approaches that we've gone over today and many, many other times, leaning in, supporting schools so that they are world-class and as safe as any uh, when it comes to COVID transmission. I think something that we have done and plan to continue to lean into. Even as other changes happen, the presence, the availability of these important tools, not just only when we need them the most, but to keep us uh, confident in where the data is moving, where communities and settings are moving is going to be key and something that we continue to be committed to. Next slide. And this winning formula plays out in the national data as well. Uh, we have 12% of the students in the country here in California schools. Uh, and we have experienced less than 1% of school closures this year. You can see that throughout uh, this, the, the nation, that there are pockets where many, many schools have closed. And that is 
uh, directly related to how we have managed and supported uh, the schools through uh, two really large surges this year. Uh, tremendous challenges and all the while focused on keeping schools safe, keeping schools uh, with students in person. Uh, and this less than 1% is something I think so many Californians can be proud of. Uh, through the discourse and dialogue and the discussion about what to do next, the value of what we've done, I think this slide speaks volumes to the efforts that we continue to work towards. Uh, next slide. So our approach has been focused on humility. Uh, the governor often says uh, humility or being humble is one of the most important things we've all learned throughout this pandemic. Uh, being flexible and being focused on the evidence. California has never been afraid to lead on schools. We are stubbornly focused on safety, implementing the evidence, and our experiences inform these policies. We were uh, even ahead of the CDC, ahead of the American Academy of Pediatrics, impl you know, implemented universal masking at the start of the school year, a key feature in helping us achieve what we've done. We've adopted smarter testing policies, including increasing the use of antigen and over-the-counter tests. I just went over some key data on how many have been sent to schools throughout the last many weeks. I think a real deep commitment that uh, not only is California one of the only states that can do what we've done, but that we have done it uh, is important. And then uh, constantly working to be a state that learns, uh, we talk about, uh, I often talk about how I want California to be uh, one of the states that learns the most and the fastest, that we have uh, not been afraid to move away from some mitigation approaches in favor of other ones that are more strongly supported by the data. We've done that by shifting away from physical distancing as a key strategy, or even our move away from individual contact tracing to group contact tracing in some school districts has been important. Not that this is the only place where we end up. We will continue to move according to the science, according to the information we have to ensure that Californians are doing all we can to keep our schools safe for students, for staff, for families and communities at large. Next slide. Uh, and uh, I also just want to talk about what is informing our approach. Uh, we've talked about some of this already. We are prioritizing heavily in-person instruction. There's no substitute, particularly for vulnerable populations. Uh, schools are not just a place where people, young people get educated. It's where many receive their meals. It's where many receive specialized services. It's where many depend on important social interactions. And not just prioritizing in-person education, but prioritizing safe in-person education. We must continue to work to ensure that low risk of catching COVID in schools that we've seen throughout this year, it's totally achievable that we maintain that for our staff and our students. We continue to work with school and education leaders, public health leaders across the state to make sure we're staying current and doing what we can to uh, to, to, to uh, uh, create this environment in, in schools. Uh, and that masking requirements were never put in place to be there forever. Uh, it isn't a question of when, but uh, 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 it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And uh, I'll get into a little bit of that in a minute. And that we will always remain prepared to adjust with the conditions of the virus. We demonstrated that with Omicron. We did it with Delta. We will do it again if there are future variants or if any of the current variants that we've seen before rear their heads again. Next slide. So where are we going? So based on our data, it's reasonable. I shared a lot of good, important data that's directionally coming down and coming down fast, that we're getting to a place where we can uh, uh, relax the statewide masking requirement in school. We uh, will today not make a change. There'll be no change in the masking requirement, but on February 28th, full two weeks from now, uh, we will reassess the data. What does that mean? It means we're gonna look at uh, information on case rates, confirm what I just showed you that we believe is gonna happen, 
which are the case numbers will continue to come down, test positivity will come down, hospitalizations, both adult and pediatric will come down, and we're watching vaccine rates. We will uh, use this opportunity to remind uh, students, families, that this is a great chance to get vaccinated, that vaccines are free, safe, and effective, that they do a lot to help protect not just the individuals, but the community at large. Um, and we're going to look at all of these different factors, as well as trends around the globe and the nation, ensuring that we aren't seeing upticks and increases down the road, and that on February 28th, we anticipate being able to uh, uh, share what the next period of time will look like and with some specificity uh, give, give a date uh, when the uh, uh, masking requirement will move to a recommendation. We also know that this takes time, that uh, not just the school community, but communities at large, families uh, need time to prepare, need time to have conversations in their communities about what local conditions might apply, whether added uh, protections are going to be considered and that those can be implemented safely. The one thing that has been uh, important throughout our entire response, especially, but not only in schools, but especially in schools, is that we don't make hasty decisions. We will take the collection of information together to make a decision that is good for California broadly. We also know that local communities are having these conversations today. And although the state sets uh, a, an important bar, that where people can't be less restrictive than the state, they can certainly begin to add layers of protection uh, in, in their communities as they see fit and those conversations take them. So uh, again, to emphasize that no change to school masking requirements now, and then on February 28th, coming together again, having assessed and reassessed the information to make an announcement as to uh, where we will go uh, moving forward. Next slide. And so, as I said, this uh, reassessment looking in two weeks is not going to be about a single indicator. It's going to be about a composite look, things like cases, things like hospitalizations, vaccination rates. As I mentioned, vaccines saves lot, save lives, but their impact takes weeks to make a difference. So we will continue to prioritize getting vaccine rates up in students and use this as an opportunity to encourage families to go forward and get vaccinated if it's something you've been considering. And then, as I said, following those national and global, global trends and understand their impact in California will be important. Next slide. So to wrap up, uh, we hopefully have continued to lay out a science-driven approach that uh, requires us to constantly evaluate all of these factors. And at times that evaluation is gonna be done in the context of a great deal of uncertainty and concern. And at other times we will do that assessment with a lot more confidence in understanding where we are based on where we've come. And that uh, it's not just one factor, but many. And directionality matters. Not just are you coming down or up, but that rate of rise or decline is also important. And that's where we've started and that's what we will continue to do here in California. So with that, uh, I believe that's the last slide. Uh, I think it is, yes. Uh, and I just wanna thank you. I know that was a uh, mouthful for me, I'm sure uh, for you as well. Uh, I, I'm happy to begin taking questions. The first question comes from Spencer Custodio, Voice of OC. Hi, Dr. Galley. As always, we really appreciate you taking our questions. Um, you hinted on it on the last part of this press conference, but um, you'd also mentioned that you know state officials are hoping to get vaccination rates for students, you know, for the younger Californians higher. I was wondering if you could preview a little bit for us before you know the February twenty eighth date. Is there like a certain threshold, say like sixty percent vaccination rate? before officials seriously start reconsidering the uh, mask mandate in schools and, you know, um, <clears throat> how much has the state officials been hearing from local school departments or school districts that they really would like the mask mandate to stay? Thank you. Sure. Um, 
first off, there uh, we we don't plan to at this moment set a threshold uh, above which or below which something happens. What I think is the real opportunity today is to explain to Californians where we are uh, with childhood vaccinations, uh, that we have a long way to go, and to work with families and communities to get that number up. It is an important, one of the most important mitigation approaches that we've seen. Um, and uh, I certainly hope as a pediatrician that number goes up, but uh, without sticking a number out there, uh, we haven't set that number. I think right now, uh, the point is that as we anticipate changes, uh, now's a great time to get vaccinated. It's an important time to get vaccinated and we encourage people to do so. Next question comes from Kristen Huang from Cal Matters. Kristen? Ask Great, thank you. Next question comes from John Wolfolk of the San Jose Mercury News. Uh, hi, Dr. Galley. Uh, thank you. Um, you. You had uh, pointed to some of the um, uh, the school disruption data um, uh, that uh, that the uh, website Burbio posts, uh, but the the data don't seem to to demonstrate a a clear connection between statewide mask mandates and outbreaks. Um, uh, am I am I reading that wrong? I mean, the state of Florida doesn't seem to have any disruptions on them at all. The state of New York has about as many as uh, California and has the same kind of mask rules or has had it. Same with uh, Oregon and Washington and many of these other states. Um, what what are you seeing in the national data that uh, that suggests that a statewide mask policy is is effective in preventing school outbreaks? Yeah, I think a couple of things. First off, the, the data really says, it, it just identifies clearly where school disruption has occurred. It doesn't say that this is uh, this level of disruption is attributed to this intervention or that intervention. It really just says this, this is the data and these are the facts. And I think the collective approach in California isn't just about masking, it's about so many other things. Uh, my entire section on schools started with the focus on uh, building up the really the health and public health infrastructure in schools to be able to track illness, the investment in vaccines, the investment in testing on top of the investments in masking. So again, uh, don't want anyone to think that it is the mask requirement that is the only thing. Uh, that has driven the success that we've seen. I think it's the collection. And I say that with a bit of focus because so many people have spent tireless hours making sure schools are safe, uh, not just focusing on masking. And that's a really important testimony to the work of Californians across. So, uh, you know, again, uh, without, without saying, well, the, the approach of one other state or uh, uh, a set of states is uh, better or worse. The connection I want to make is our work together on a number of different layers has made a difference for Californians keeping schools going. Next question comes from Alex Michelson, Fox 11 News. Hi, Dr. Galley. Thank you for talking to us. And I like your kids' uh, artwork in the back. Um, a, a question, though, you know, that there are a lot of parents that are going to be outraged by what you're saying today that are saying it's time to unmask our kids. They see images of the Super Bowl yesterday, 70,000 people, almost nobody wearing masks. They know that adults are going to be able to take off their masks. They know that kids, by and large part, do not have as bad of health outcomes as older adults. What do you say to outraged parents who say it is past time to unmask our kids, especially if adults can take off their masks, why can't kids, especially if we believe in the vaccines, which kids can now take, if we believe in the air filtration systems, and we believe in the mitigation efforts? Yeah, Alex, thank you. Um, and, and thanks for always being a fan of the kid art. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, what I would say is, um, first off, I know and hear and uh, listen to the uh, frustration from uh, many California parents. And I 
would say uh, the message today, which I hope is clear, is today a change isn't being made, but in two weeks, confirming that the data continues to be where it is, taking the time to prepare and work with the school community and communities at large, that we anticipate making the change at that point. And that change is going to be one that I think will be met with a lot of uh, excitement in some and a lot of fear in other circles. And so, uh, Alex, your question, uh, uh, if I could say, is only uh, 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 part of the story in California. And we know that there are other voices that uh, are, are, are uh, you, you know, to be heard and to be considered. And as we move forward looking and basing our decision in the evidence and information that we have, understanding that we will continue to prepare and continue to support schools to stay in person for all students, not just some students. And we know that there are many students who must come to school because that's where they get their education, they get their meals, they get other important services. Uh, those are young kids with underlying conditions and concerns, people who've lost family members to COVID, that this is not a decision that we make lightly or in a hasty way. And we want to make sure that those local conversations are teed up for success as well. We know that in some pockets of California, there'll be a decision to maintain something even beyond when the state makes a decision to change. And in other parts, it will be an immediate change. And we want to uh, we've always uh, let local conditions be an uh, important driver in determination. So the point is parents should not hear that we aren't making a move. We are taking a little bit more time to consider the information, work with our partners across the state to make sure when the move is made that we are do doing it successfully and uh, with communities empowered to continue to be safe. Next question comes from Kitty Alvarado with KPBS. Yes, hi, thank you so much for taking uh, my question. I was just wondering, people are, or health officials are treading really carefully when it comes to endemic versus pandemic. Uh, is the state of California looking to update the entire pandemic safety plan in general? Uh, and go towards more of an endemic route? And if so, what will that look like? Um, th thanks for the thoughtful question. And as the governor has, uh, has alluded to, we are working uh, hard on uh, really uh, updating how we move into the next phase. That uh, this, what we're talking about today is part of that conversation. How do we approach the use of a tool like masking and other tools moving forward. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, I know uh, the, the team is working hard to make sure that uh, when it is presented by the governor, that it is something that uh, people can really understand, relate to, uh, recognizes the successes and the work that we've done to get to this point and gives uh, people a sense, especially in the medium, uh, short and medium run, uh, how we will work in California to keep Californians safe. Next question comes from Don Thompson with the AP. Good afternoon. A couple of uh, uh, layered questions here, if I may. If, uh, one alluding to what you just talked about a little bit, as far as the why, why take a statewide approach when we've often or you often said that this is uh, varies by communities, and do you expect it to have some sort of differentiated approach when you do roll it out, and based on what metrics would you be looking for? And then what, as far as what held up the decision that was promised today, as far as the, the key sticking points, for instance, with teachers unions, if you can outline some of those. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, first, on the first part of your question, uh, the focus is going to be on being prepared and being ready. Uh, I think we have all learned that setting thresholds and setting and committing to uh, a single point of data, a single point in time, uh, 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 sort of glosses over the need to continue working hard to be ready and be prepared. So California's plan 
Uh, of course, we'll talk about data and data elements and their importance, but is largely going to be focused on how we stay prepared and ready and what Californians should come to expect. Uh, in terms of the decision here, I've said multiple times today that this is not a decision that we take lightly. It's not a decision that is a hasty one. It is not one that um, should only be left uh, uh, at the regional level. It's something that the state uh, can continue to provide some important guidance on and important uh, uh, data to inform. But yes, in this case, there will be the ability, as there has been throughout, that uh, communities that want to add additional layers of protection as they see fit should and can. Uh, and that the decision, as far as uh, I'm concerned, is one that we have been thinking through and working hard on because of the data and the information, the recommendations, not just uh, here at the state level, but taking into account recommendations uh, at the federal level, the CDC still recommends masks in schools, uh, masks in certain other places, uh, that, that uh, it's important that we take all of that into account. So uh, uh, alluding to other factors and uh, points, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I you know, certainly appreciate the question, but will tell you that my concern, my team, our team's concern, our work with many others is looking at what information we have to help us understand where we're going to be going so we can make a safe decision for uh, students and citizens of California. The next question comes from Ali Tayden with EdSource. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if the statewide mask mandate drops, will individual districts still reserve the right to keep their masking policies in place? And if they do so, will they still be provided with masks? So the commitment to continue and providing masks uh, as the state has been is something that we're always, uh, uh, is not uh, linked to this decision or this, uh, or what happens in the next many weeks. I said uh, and this is not just true of masks, but true of tests, true of other supports, especially around outbreaks, that the state and local health jurisdictions will continue to play the important role that we have throughout the pandemic. Um, and uh, yes, local decisions are uh, not just allowed, they're well supported. They are uh, issues that help consider some of those local trends in the data, local trends in um, what works and what doesn't work in communities. And I think that will be, as it has been, uh, an important feature moving forward, whether that's at the district level or the local health jurisdiction level. I certainly want to emphasize because of my admiration and appreciation for local health leaders, those local health jurisdictions that are working hand in glove with districts and schools directly to make sure that uh, not just uh, outbreaks are managed and, and uh, tests are available, but these sorts of decisions are made thoughtfully. Next question comes from Julia McAvoy with KQED. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I am wondering if you're not in this methodology that you're using right here, which is going to uh, once again push it down to the school and local level to make these calls on whether to mask or unmask. If you're not putting schools smack in the middle of the political debate again, where they once again have to face some parents who want the masks off and other parents who want the masks on. And it just seems to put them in a vise where all along they've been really wishing for more clarity and direction from the state where they could just do their jobs and point to the state as, as sort of the leader in what they should be doing. If you leave it up to local jurisdictions, are you not putting school districts in the medical, middle of the mask debate once again? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. Let me just be clear. The state has led and had uh, uh, requirements or 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 uh, application of our mitigation tools in specified ways throughout, not just in schools, but all over. So um, California, I think, has done this more uh, than almost any other state in terms of providing that blanket protection, uh, blanket approach across the state. And we have always talked about how uh, not just at the school district level, which I appreciate is different when it comes to schools, but at the local level and to provide opportunities 
for local jurisdictions, whether that's at the health level or at a school education level, to help inform those local decisions with the state as a floor, with the state as a uh, benchmark above which you can't become less restrictive, if you will, um, I think has been an important, uh, important approach. And uh, part of the decision that is being announced today is to provide districts and schools and local health jurisdictions and those at the local level a chance to have these important conversations, which will look different in different parts of the state, so that um, when uh, the decision is made at the state level, that people are most well prepared. I think the last thing anyone would like is to be put in a situation to make a difficult decision without information without uh, an opportunity to be ready to have the conversations needed to make that effectively for a community, for a city, for a county, or for the state. Next question comes from Victoria Colliver of Politico. Hi, Dr. Galley. Thanks for taking my call. I guess to push back on this point about metrics, I, I'm still confused why there wouldn't be some sort of threshold, because if you're going to say, hey, we're going to lift this mask mandate or tell teach school districts what to do, I would think that they need more uh, guideposts in this. And I, I just can't wrap my head around that. So hoping you can go back at it again. Sure. Uh, I guess, um, you, you know, when we look at metrics, there's a lot of different data points that one considers. And we, we are saying that we're going to look at them collectively. We know we have work to do on vaccine rates. Different, some schools, some school districts are well above 80% vaccinations, others aren't. Um, and, and I think that's an important feature that needs to be considered as part of a collective understanding about the level of circulating virus in a community. That's where case rates, the um, toll on hospitals and the impact not just on adults, but on kid hospitalizations is going to be critical. So an approach that doesn't just look at one metric, doesn't set one threshold, has always been important in California. And we will continue to use that collaborative, comprehensive, cumulative approach to help provide guidance. And uh, the, the idea that we won't... Uh, haven't or we won't share the information uh, at the state level. So cities and counties who have their own data can uh, contextualize it in the broader set of state information. Um, that will continue to be made available and time to make that decision is important. So again, uh, uh, not leaning towards one single point or even a firm cutoff point, I think has been important for us throughout. We of course set goals and I think there's schools uh, that have set goals, districts that have set goals around a number of metrics that allude to where their comfort level is in a community to do one or another of the mitigation approaches, including masking. And I think those conversations, if they haven't started already, certainly uh, will, and giving time for them to happen completely, I think is very important uh, at the statewide level. Next question comes from Kyle Stokes of KPCC. Hi, Dr. Galley. Thanks again for taking our questions. I I'm, I'm, want to clarify something that you said just a second ago about basically you said that the decision, uh, I'm just reading from my notes back here, that we anticipate making the change at that point. You were referring to this February 28th date. Does that mean that if you see everything that you want to see on February 28th, that the mask mandate goes away at the at like on March 1st, does that mean that we're setting a timetable to set a timetable, like uh, the mask mandate will be dropped at some future date that you're definitely going to set at that point? Or are you not even committing to set a date today, uh, you know, for ending the mandate? You'll just say we're going to get another update on the 28th. Like, how should we be thinking about this announcement? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, so ju just to be clear, no change today, February 28th, reassessment based on the number of factors that I've gone through a couple of times. And given what we are seeing today, given the course of the conversations, anticipating that on February 28th, announcing a date for when we move from a requirement to a strong recommendation, and in that giving time, before we announce it, not before, but 
it, between February 28th and the announcement or the, the actual date where the requirement is changing to the strong recommendation that that time period, although not set today, it's uh, certainly going to take some time for schools and leaders and public health uh, leaders across the state to prepare, for families to prepare. So it's not a decision that happens uh, you know, the next day or, or in the next couple of days, but certainly something that uh, we will uh, uh, be sharing clearly and setting a timetable uh, uh, if we see the information that we hope and frankly expect to see uh, on the 28th. The next question comes from Samantha Young with Kaiser Health News. Hi, Dr. Galley. Thank you for taking um, our questions. Um, what about the school districts like Roseville? Um, the Sacramento Bee last week uh, had a story saying that they were going to be this week lifting their own mask mandate. Uh, is there, can local school districts do that ahead of the statewide announcement? No, uh, you know, we've we've seen throughout this uh, pandemic that uh, whether it's a school, whether it's a city or a county, that there is a lot of energy on each of these different uh, efforts uh, and we've seen it throughout. And uh, so a district like Roseville, uh, they're they're in the state of California. So the state requirements apply. Um, and and I think that will be uh, an important uh, uh, an important point to make, not just here, but for other efforts uh, that we've used throughout this pandemic and, and we may need to use uh, down the road as well. Next question comes from Ashley Zavala with Next Star Media Group. Hi, Dr. Kelly. Um, I just wanted to ask about just the statewide overall mask mandate. I'm getting a lot of flashbacks to June 15th when the mask mandate was lifted and then two weeks later, multiple counties had to re-implement them. And I'm wondering if your the administration foresees that happening at this point. Um, and would it be safe to say that this is the end of a statewide mask mandate? Um, you know, I have uh, actually gotten out of the prediction game. Uh, I spend a lot more of my time thinking about planning, thinking about what happens if we do see something change and are we going to be ready? So I, I won't, uh, won't predict what happens uh, with any of the tools that we've used to keep Californians safe. Um, that said, uh, you know, I think it's going to be important. We will always continue to watch the data. Uh, we will see that as we move from a requirement to a strong recommendation, and I keep saying it that way because it's important to understand that we're not lifting a masking uh, 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 concept in California. We aren't going from mask one day, don't mask the next. It's really a strong recommendation, and there are plenty of Californians, and many know who they are with underlying conditions, who have vulnerable individuals in their, commu in their families and communities who will make, and I hope make it, uh, you know, in a way that is supported by their communities to, to, wear, to wear a mask in indoor places and wherever they feel comfortable wearing their mask. And that in some cities and some counties, they will put in place uh, uh, what will be added layers of protection beyond what the state is doing because the conditions in their community allow for it. So unlike uh, June 15th, uh, I think it's a really strong part of the message that masks are a valuable tool. In the presentation today, I shared some of our California data that demonstrates that. And that uh, using them uh, based on your own sense of uh, wh when there isn't a requirement, based on your own sense of when it was protective for you, uh, I think is going to be an important feature of our communities and societies move, moving forward, and one that I hope uh, Californians will support their neighbor in making that personal decision when there isn't the requirement per se. Next question comes from Laura Cordy with the Sacramento Bee. Hi, Dr. Galley. Thanks so much for uh, taking our questions and chatting with us today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about moving into the endemic phase. If the coronavirus pandemic is reclassified, how does that change what daily life is going to look like for Californians 
And is there any talk of doing a, a fourth shot for people who have already gotten both doses and the booster? Yeah, just the last question first. Um, you know, I think this is this is an evolving field. Uh, we we see what uh, immune response people get days, weeks after, and we see that it peaks and it starts to drop. And that after a second dose and a third dose, it goes a little higher and maybe is even stronger and lasts a bit longer, but wouldn't rule out any way that it starts to come down. And I think some places have started, some nations have seen uh, some reduced immunity in individuals who uh, who are months after their third dose or their booster dose. So uh, in that area, I think we we stand ready to adjust based on what the science and the clinical trial trials show us and our real world experience. Um, so I think that's going to be key. Secondly, as we move uh, into the next phase of the pandemic, I think it's really important that we uh, not just talk about uh, uh, endemic phase, but how do we continue to live with a virus that changes and kind of throws curveballs at different times? And one thing is for sure that I don't think anyone can really predict. You read the evidence uh, in the papers like I do that some people uh, uh, put their nickel down on uh, that only the next variants, if one emerges, will be less virulent, less concerning than Omicron. And others say, well, that doesn't make sense scientifically. We've seen that Delta and Alpha were more virulent, more transmissible than prior uh, variants. So uh, I think for California and our future, it is about being ready and being prepared, learning from what we've done, learning from uh, our experiences to date, and making sure Californians can feel confident in the tools that we're putting together. But more on that later. Uh, we're certainly uh, interested in supporting the state to continue to move through uh, this, this uh, uh, pandemic, this uh, uh, experience with uh, COVID, and, and uh, we expect and plan to do it uh, successfully as a state. The next question comes from Peter Joust with KESQ. Hi, Dr. Galley. Here in the Coachella Valley, we have several major music festivals and sporting events coming up. In terms of restrictions, what do attendees need to know and how will those restrictions be enforced? Yeah, I mean, first, first off, uh, as I sort of said, California, uh, depending again, indoor, outdoor, vaccinated, unvaccinated, there's going to be some important uh, information that attendees should pay attention to. The state will have some requirements, uh, largely aligning with our federal partners at the CDC. And then locally, there may be some added uh, layers of protection and support that will drive behaviors at those events. I mean, largely, and if you take a step back, we're coming out of one of the most challenging COVID surges that we've experienced. Yes, it, people sort of hang their hat on, well, people don't become as sick. People don't have to worry about being hospitalized. There may be some truth to that. And we saw a tremendous amount of transmission, a tremendous amount of infection. We've seen people infected in many different settings um, and with differing severities. So, uh, you know, if you're asking my advice, uh, if attending a large scale event, uh, keep your mask near you, know and get vaccinated and try to be in a group when you know others are vaccinated as well. And I think that will help uh, keep people safe uh, and keep people um, not just safe, but safely enjoying what I think so many people are looking forward to. Next question comes from Sean Hubler with the New York Times. Uh, yes, hello. Thanks, Dr. Galley, um, for, for taking our questions today. Uh, two things. Uh, I missed sort of your answer on the question about the extent to which organized labor and teachers unions are influencing the timing of school mask recommendations. Um, and, and then secondly, on a broader level, I'm interested, what, what lessons is California drawing um, um, about dealing long term not just with this pandemic, but with the next one. What what sort of um, yeah. long term changes do you see? Do you see happening around the state? What measures do you see happening uh, that might buttress uh, the state against 
the next pandemic and the next. Yeah, so dealing with your second question first, I'll come back to the first. Um, first off, uh, so much of what we've done in California and uh, I've had uh, not always uh, uh, as much time as I would like, but certainly uh, a lot of time to look and see what we've done. Uh, look and see all of the tremendous investments and efforts and um, structures we built up to help us get through the different twists and turns with COVID, the surges, the the you know lower levels of transmission, uh, and and I think we've done a tremendous amount. And those are not just efforts that served us well during COVID, but they are efforts that are going to continue to serve us well. So whether it's in the face of another pandemic, if that's what uh, comes our way, uh, or it's just how we manage respiratory diseases that are airborne and transmissible, that are seasonal, that are around all the time, or whether it's how we're going to begin approaching improvements in health overall, not just physical health, chronic diseases, but also behavioral health and other conditions. And how do we support our communities? Because I think we not just focused on when and how to use mitigation strategies that we're focused on in today's conversation, but I think the structures that we have built up uh, across the state, um, building upon, renovating prior structures is gonna be really important and support us moving forward. As far as um, other influences in the decision, as I said, and I'll try to state it more clearly, um, the decision that I'm sharing with you today is based on the information and the data that we see. We've always said that schools are an important area to protect and support. They are not just places for learning, not just places for services for young places, not just places that important Californians work, but they allow our entire economy to move forward. So the decision that I'm sharing today, some might say, well, why is it a dis different one than the general mask update that you made that yes, we're moving forward with a change in the guidance, change in to a strong recommendation from a requirement uh, after February 15th for public indoor masking. Why isn't the same at schools? Because schools have been an important place for us to focus on for, for some time. So um, with that said, uh, that is what drove the decision. Those are the considerations. And of course, conversations with all interested parties, whether those are groups um, from uh, uh, teachers and staff or public health leaders that are listening to voices throughout their communities, that those, those are part of the decision as well. Um, but, but uh, the, or, or voices that we listen to as part of the decision, but it's really based on uh, this situation we've had with schools since the beginning. Important to not, not just treat differently, but really focus on some of those important efforts that keep uh, uh, kids moving forward and the uh, uh, experience of adults as well. The next question comes from Paul Sijin with the San Diego Union Tribune. Paul, you may be on mute. Roger, we had, a, I think, a question from Paul earlier. I, I don't think so, but we'll go on to okay, our final. Maybe oh, no, maybe. Yeah, we're going on to the final question. That's uh, Hal Eisner with Fox 11. Dr. Galley, good to have this opportunity. Thank you so much. I, I wanted to ask you something uh, based on a conversation I had this morning with a mother from Malibu and, and her eight-year-old daughter. And during this period of heat that we've been experiencing, her daughter was out on the play yard, fainted, uh, later determined to be a combination of dehydration and uh, and the heat and, and, and the mask exacerbated the situation, apparently. I'm not a doctor. But why can't you, and I'm appealing to your pediatrician side here, why can't you just say, you know, when you're outdoors, like in many other situations we're seeing here, when you're outdoors, a mask is required social distancing, yes. Or if you're going to be right next to some kid, wear a mask. But why, why? I mean, there is that potential for dehydration. There is that potential for a child to pass out. 
Yeah, um, I uh, very much appreciate the question, not just as a pediatrician, but as a father of an eight-year-old. Uh, you know, we, we're, my wife and I think about how this impacts our own kids. And uh, I think the situation you're raising uh, is one that people ask a lot about. Is there a uh, known impact on respiratory status or development or behavioral health, uh, mental health, uh, wellness? And, and uh, I think there's a lot of uh, important uh, individual experiences with not just masking, but other mitigation approaches and COVID altogether. We know that Californians have borne a great deal of um, trauma, great deal of uh, uh, difficulty throughout the pandemic, loss. Uh, we started this conversation identifying over 80,000 individuals who've lost their life to COVID and their families and their communities that lost their influence um, kids who've lost caregivers, uncles, aunts, grandmas, grandpas, friends, it's real, this impact. So I don't want to dismiss in any way these uh, issues. And uh, we know that uh, in certain settings, indoor settings, that uh, masking has been a valuable tool to help support not just schools, but other entities to keep functioning when transmission is high. So uh, with that said, I know that local communities support outdoor masking in certain settings, and that may be the case uh, uh, in, in the school that you're talking about, but that isn't universally true in all of California. Um, and and uh, I think that especially uh, when you experience a bit of a heat wave like we had in Southern California, where temperatures went up pretty quickly, uh, you, you know, I, I, I hope all Schools, all parents, all activities are encouraging young people to stay hydrated um, and, and uh, uh, to, to, to obviously pay attention to uh, how kids are feeling, not just this young eight-year-old that you mentioned. Hopefully she's doing well now but uh, for, for all students. But the, the, the evidence that masking and mask wearing in the setting that you're talking about plays a significant role. Um, has not at least been presented to me. Uh, and certainly our teams that track that information on a number of levels um, uh, haven't seen uh, that evidence as well. So I, I think, Roger, you said that was the last question. I know it was a bit of a marathon. I think last time I was with you, it was just under an hour. So this time we uh, broke that uh, 2022 uh, uh, record. I appreciate everyone asking questions working to get clarifications and uh, sitting through this important conversation. And with that, I'll say, have a good afternoon.